Welcome in, everybody, to the CFP Nation All-America Podcast. My name is Bill Trochi, Senior Editor at SportingNews.com, along with Bill Bender, our lead college football writer at SportingNews.com. Welcome to our, our Wednesday show. Uh, we have, uh, for the folks that have been with us from the beginning, we were doing one show a week. Now we're doing two. We're doing a, a Wednesday morning uh, podcast and a Thursday morning podcast. So uh, welcome to our Wednesday show. And we are coming off a of week three that that featured a lot of blowouts early. I mean, in the top top nine, I guess. I looked at it this morning. The top nine, I had, but there was plenty of drama to be found elsewhere. Right, Bill? Yeah, it was a fun week. Um, not a great week. I, uh, there was some magic in in Boone. Obviously, <laughs> there was a lot of blowouts. Um, and and some things we'll get into this week. But as I pointed out, I think the top four teams in the country won by fifty three and a half points. You can't dress that up. They're just all very very good, and we can get into that here in a bit. Yeah, no question about it. I mean, the, uh, the those teams will get their attention obviously throughout the season. This was a week to kind of look at uh, at some other schools uh, that that are having some, you know, producing some memorable moments, some memorable games. Uh, but we'll start actually in the desert with uh, Herm Edwards. Uh, he was fired after a thirty-one to uh, thirty to twenty-one loss to Eastern Michigan. On uh, he was fired on Sunday. Uh, the, his uh, five year or four plus year uh, stint in the desert comes to a close and. Uh, Bill, what do you, what do you, it was a curious hire to begin with. Um, he had some success. I don't know if it was a total failure. Uh, what went wrong for Herm? Well, I, I'm curious fire. I mean, there's allegations he got fired on the field, which if I write a bad story Saturday at the Ohio State Wisconsin game, are you going to fire, meet me on the, end zone in the shoe and fire me i hope not um, you never know you never know it could be a very average story you never know but i didn't go problem with this is since 2015 i'm not at a program that just hasn't found the rhythm you know what i mean like they had a 10 win season with todd graham in 14 they're 44 and 40 cents so to me you know herm wasn't the answer i thought he might be you know he was part of that class of coaching hires that you thought okay nfl experience dynamic in the studio probably going to relate to kids well, you know, would love for my son to play for him type coach. And it just hasn't worked out. I mean, their record 44 and 40, which I mentioned, that's comparable to Iowa state uh, in the same stretch. And Iowa state has the right coach, has the right guy for that type of school. So, you know, where does Arizona state go from here? I, I would say I would throw out the name Dan Mullen. We can get into why, but I mean, it, it's, it's not a hire and a fire that really moved the college football needle other than the trouble that Arizona State got in along the way. Yeah, they've got some allegations hanging over their head for uh, hosting recruits during the, the pandemic in 2020. Uh, Arizona State only played four games that year because they had a bunch of COVID issues and, and games were canceled and things like that. But, you know, the word is that Antonio Pierce, the defensive coordinator and the recruiting co associate head coach eventually – was kind of uh, not really paying attention to the dead periods and paying for recruits to come on visits uh, when they were unofficial. They're supposed to be un well, there's supposed to be no visits, but they're certainly supposed to be unofficial if, if people did come on campus. The Arizona State was paying for those, and uh, you know, Herm had half his staff seemingly leave uh, heading into this year. They had a lot of high-profile transfers, including, including quarterback Jaden Daniels. And then, you know, the lackluster play was kind of, uh, you know, in, in week three was kind of the, the last straw for him. Um, one interesting name I saw floated out there was Deion Sanders. I don't know if uh, you give him a, a, a shot out in the desert. He certainly would uh, bring some attention as he has done at Jackson State. Um, I don't know. You think Deion could work out at Arizona State? Well, they're leaning into the whole party school thing. And I've never been on Arizona State's campus. I'm sure they they party. I went to a party school as well. I mean, we we put us we, we put Ohio University up against anybody and we're not scared of that label. If there was a twelve team playoff party school tournament, my alma mater would be in it, no doubt. Um at, at large bid. No, we give first round game <laughs> on campus because then you could go to Court Street. So but no, I mean that would be an ultra flashy hire. I don't know if that's a Dion job. The reason I said Dan Mullen and you just touched on it was quarterback play, right? You have to go all the way back to 1996 when they were on uh, the Rose Bowl with Bruce Snyder. They actually had a guy from my high school played on the team, Pete Rotkiss. He was a walk on, played on the team. It was awesome. We were all excited for Pete because we saw him play in the Rose Bowl. But 
we weren't there. We were there to watch Jake Plummer too. And since Plummer, they've only had two NFL drafted quarterbacks, Andrew Walter and uh, Brock Osweiler. So to me, you bring a guy in there like Dan Mullen, who had a track record of success at quarterback at Mississippi State, can use the Dak Prescott card in the studio for a year. Typically that works out. And, you know, he, he made it work in Starkville. I think he could make it work out there. Yeah, and he had Kyle Trask, too. Let's not forget about him. He put up some amazing numbers at Florida with Mullen uh, as well. Now that Herm is off the hot seat list that we we you know we had a hot, hot seat list at the beginning of the season, uh, I wrote the story and Scott Frost was on it. Herm Edwards was on it. Uh, so now it's, it's shrunk. Who is the next off the list? Who do you think? Is it Brian Harson at Auburn? Yeah, that, that's who I would put. I know we could talk about Jeff Collins or Carl Dorrell. Uh, Brian Harson had a really bad loss this weekend because SEC schools don't like losing to Big Ten schools to begin with, let alone get embarrassed at home. First time they bring in a Penn State team that – you know, the uniform combination looked cool, and then it didn't look very cool for Auburn after that. Um, <laughs> I think it was an eye-opening win. I mean, the signature kind of portrait of that game is going to be Nick Singleton busting off the 52-yard run or 42-yard run. And um, Auburn has quarterback problems, too. It's a common thing here. Uh, you look at the, their two quarterbacks, Finley and Ashford, 48 of 82, two touchdowns, six interceptions. That's not going to cut it in the SEC West. He's already 8-8. Eight and eight feel like there's build up negativity you start to hear the urban meyer chatter not to auburn necessarily but in general then you're giving auburn fans and boosters ideas i i think i always say fit matters you and i talk about this all the time fit matters in college football and i'm not sure that that's the right fit and they've got missouri this weekend at home i mean if they lose that game it might he might not last i mean a month Bill, right. look at their schedule. How many – you look at their schedule and tell I'm me. I'm looking how many, at it right now, yeah. How many – you have it up. I'm not pulling it up, but how many – Right SEC after that, wins? it's it's LSU, it's Georgia, it's Ole Miss, it's Arkansas. <laughs> we haven't gotten to Texas A&M and Alabama eventually. So Who's yeah. their FCS freebie? Do they have one at the end? Western Kentucky. Who's not – That's that not a freebie. a freebie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's not a freebie. Not with, They have quarterback play, and they – so, yeah, that's my way of saying if they go four and eight, they would now to be fair, they were predicted to finish last in the SEC West, and it's a grinder. But I could see them being next. I could see you, you mentioned Jeff Collins in, in our podcast prep. I mean, you maybe know a little bit more about that one since you're closer to it. Um, that could happen too. That one's right there. Man, they they are struggling. I mean, the last it's just everything's worked against him. I like him. He's a nice, seems like a nice guy and stuff like that. But just you know, their last four games, the two to end last season was Notre Dame and Georgia, two top five teams. They were outscored a hundred to nothing. Uh, and then the two teams they played this year, uh, two power five teams were Clemson and Ole Miss, were two very good teams too. But one hundred and eighty three to ten in those four games. I mean, that's an average of what forty five to to three basically um they're at ucf this week they're 18 point dogs then they have to play number 24 pittsburgh uh i looked his buy his buyouts 10 and a half million and georgia tech is not uh you know flowing in cash so it drops to 7.2 million in january do they let him you know finish the year out of a of a you know two and nine three uh, two and ten three and nine kind of a year and, and save $3 million, you know, the, the question people always ask is, you know, can you afford not to do it? Can you afford the, the ticket, uh, the re- revenue lost and tickets sold and, the, and how much it's going to be hurt in recruiting and trying to find, you know, getting a jump on the next coach and that kind of thing. Um, so you could save $3 million if you waited till January, if things continue as they are, as they seem like they're going to. Um, but that might cost you more in the long run. Yeah, and then they'll recycle another group of five higher. I mean, you just said it, 18-point dogs against Gus. Gus and UCF, I mean, that mm-hmm. that's a guy that probably would take a shot at a Power 5 school sooner rather than later if he continues to win there. Um, it's weird that we brought that up. Auburn never had a losing season with Gus. They had a lot of ups and downs and a lot of weird moments, but – you know, they, they probably would have taken Gus about seven o'clock on Saturday night. And I, and honestly, Georgia Tech would probably probably take Gus right now. 
Yeah, they might put they, they might ride the Gus bus back to Atlanta if they could. <laughs> right. And that's and that's you know, this early season trend hire. I don't like it. I, I don't like firing coaches during the season. I understand it. I just don't I look at it from the eyes of like a senior player that your season's nuked. If you're a Nebraska senior, if you're uh, you know, uh, an Arizona State senior, what what are you supposed to do? You rally around an interim coach, or in theory you do, and and then what happens to Nebraska? Um mm-hmm get just drilled by Oklahoma on Saturday. So it's it's a tough trend, but we'll see who's next. I, I would still say Harzen and Collins are probably the leaders in that one. Right. And, and Carl Durrell of Colorado, uh, athletic director Rick George, came out with a statement on Sunday after uh, Colorado fell to 0-3, uh, all three losses by 25 points. Minnesota just crushed them this uh, last Saturday. His buyout is $8.7 million. Not sure Colorado's got the dough for that, but – um, he's someone to keep an eye on too, because whenever the athletic director feels compelled to make a statement publicly, you know things are not going well. Uh, let's go into the weekend results. So yeah, you you touched on the top four. I went to top nine. AP top nine went nine and zero oh, with an average margin of victory of forty three point three points. Okay, but we had some excitement after that. Number ten Arkansas needed a twenty one point fourth quarter to beat old friend Bobby Petrino. And then uh, numbers 11, 12, and 13 all lost. Um, so those four games, we kept talking Arkansas at 10, and then uh, the 11, 12, and 13 teams were Michigan State, BYU, and Miami, all coming off of the loss. Any of those losses jump out at you? Oh, Michigan State. We talked about that stat last week, but then to see it come to fruition when you you thought the Spartans might be a little bit different. I think Jaden Reed's injury was a huge role in that, but – they couldn't run the ball. Maybe that's probably what caught my attention most. When you average 1.4 yards per carry on the road, Michael Penix was awesome. The Huskies. I saw one fan. I love this part, too. When I was watching the game, I see one wash. I've seen this a couple times with Washington. There's a dude. There's always a dude in the stands with the 1990 National Championships. Not a shirt, a, like a sweatshirt. Like it looks like the old IOU sweatshirts, and I respect it because it had to be hot. And you're wearing that sweatshirt to the game. So there's some hope in Washington now. I think Michael Penix makes them very interesting. They uh, We'll see how they ride that against Stanford. But to me, it was them. It was Washington and Penn State winning the way that they did and maybe jumping outside the top 10. And, and you, you mentioned Miami. Um, just not there yet again. You know, drop passes, drop punts, bad bad decisions in the red zone. Um I mean, because I wasn't like blown away with how good AM was. I was more surprised that Miami kind of let that one slip away. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. I thought Jimbo was starting to run, run out the clock halfway through the third quarter. As soon as they got that punt return, you know, uh, fumbled punt by Miami, AM cashed it in for a touchdown. Jimbo was looking to get the clock to zeros because <laughs> he knows he doesn't have great quarterback play. Max Johnson, uh, you know, came in this week. Uh, for his first start, but you know he wasn't that much of an upgrade. So, yeah, Tyler Van Dyke, big showcase for him. He did not step up to the plate. He did not hit a home run. Um, Miami, just the play calling, it just seemed like a lot of three and five yard passes, and they never really tried to, you know, stretch the A and M defense at all. A and M's got a good D. I, you know, I, I think uh, they have a good D line and things like that, but. I, I was disappointed that Miami could only, you know, come up with three field goals in that game, especially when it was desperation time. And that, you know, fourth quarter, you gotta you gotta be going for the sticks. And they just kept throwing passes that were short of the sticks and and then getting tackled and they they just could not move the ball. So um yeah, I think uh, you mentioned Washington and then Oregon beating up BYU and then you know USC rolling to another win. The Pac twelve isn't as dead as we thought. Yeah, you were slacking about this slack slacking is that a verb um it is now we were it is now well we were talking about it saturday night and i think you were on to something so i'll give you the credit for it that pac-12 has some playoff power right now so some intriguing matchups to be able to beat the big 10 and their non-conference games two weeks in a row you know you got to give washington state credit for what they did to wisconsin and then oregon just destroying byu i mean we were all worried about bo nix this bo nix that he played well so now, I think on a semi-regular basis, you're going to have a big Pac-12 game the rest of the way, whether it's Oregon and Washington State this week or even on some level, Oregon State and USC. I think the curiosity factor, I, I 
got a crush on USC right now because I've watched them really closely the last two weeks. I love that offense. It definitely resembles the Lincoln Riley machine in Oklahoma. I think Caleb Williams has got a very good chance to win the Heisman. Um, and USC's a glamour team. So if Oregon's good and Utah's good and uh, Washington State and Washington are good, I think the Apple Cups are going to be awesome, by the way. Michael Penix and um, Cameron Ward, that, mm-hmm. that I, I, they've made that mm-hmm. a good game that I'm going to watch and be very interested in now. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, Marcus Freeman won a game. <laughs> and unfortunately for Notre Dame, that was breaking news. Uh, it looked like uh, the Irish had it won when they got an interception late in the game, but a, a targeting call, good targeting call, uh, gave the ball back to Cal. Then it looked like Cal might have fumbled the ball away with about 30 seconds to go, and Notre Dame returned it for a touchdown, but the knee was down, another good call. Um, uh, and then uh, the Irish almost misplayed a Hail Mary on the last play of the game, did not bat the ball down. Almost paid for it. Cal uh, uh, said they were going to go for two, actually, uh, had that Hail Mary worked. And that would have been extremely interesting. Uh, but Marcus Freeman finally got to walk off the field with a win, albeit it wasn't easy. And it begs the question, how many easy wins is Notre Dame going to have this year? Well, I don't care. I mean, and I say it from that way, like, I think we're ambulance chasing Notre Dame a little bit, if you know what I mean. We're waiting for the next disaster. And I know that's part of the deal with Notre Dame. I get it. but And we sketched it out. I think they're still going to make a bowl game. Do you? I mean, yes, they have tough games. They they play Clemson. They play USC. They play North Carolina this week. Are they going to be a dog against Syracuse, Bill? I doubt it. It depends. I mean, the defenses look pretty good, really, all three weeks. They, they, they failed in the fourth quarter against Ohio State, mm-hmm. and they failed in the fourth quarter against Marshall. But generally, they they played pretty well. They haven't given up more than 24 points in these three games. Um, So the defense is going to keep them in it. It just depends what they get out of their offensive line. You know, I mean, I think Drew Pine is a quarterback that needs to be protected. Um, They're not going to blow anybody out. And uh, Mm -hmm. like you said, yeah, they they have a challenging schedule starting this weekend uh, at North Carolina. 3.30 3.30 game. You spent some time researching North Carolina quarterback Drake May this week for a feature that's going to run sportingnews.com on Thursday morning. Uh, what did you find out about Drake? Yeah, I mean, like when I say with Notre Dame, when I say I don't care, it's like they're always going to be in the spotlight anyway. Like this is a game for both. They're slight underdog against North Carolina. You said they Notre Dame needs to learn how to run the football or they're in trouble in all these games. So – and they, if they can't run the ball this week, they'll be in trouble because Drake May is pretty good. I had a chance to speak with him. His dad, Mark, played at North Carolina. His brother, obviously, Luke, people were familiar with him. He hit one of the most significant shots. It's not the Jordan shot, but it's close against Kentucky. And and uh, Sam Howe, he followed him and got a chance to talk to all of those guys. And just the the generational pool of this all Tar Heel family. Drake May is pretty good, though, too. The, too. If you watch the tape, he's tall. He can run. He uses the pump fake well. He sees the field well for a first-year starter. Awesome chance. And and this is what I'm talking about, Notre Dame. The story Saturday, if North Carolina wins, it won't be Drake May is awesome. Look at the Tar Heels. They're 4-0. It's going to be Notre Dame's 1-3. and And that's why I get a little annoyed with it because I like Marcus Freeman. I see what the big picture is at Notre Dame. You called it at the beginning of the season, said this is going to be bumpy. I didn't want to listen. So for me, it's – if they get to seven wins, great. They go. Where do, I don't even know where I put them in this week's bowl projections. It was not a glamour bowl, but um, they're in one. And I, I think the Bulls would take a five and seven Notre Dame team. They probably would. Um, so, but like I said, Drake May. It's going to be a lot of fun this weekend. He's a good quarterback. And um, what strikes me with his game the most is just he'll run it a little bit, and you're going to be like, wait, this dude's pretty fast. Um, so Notre Dame better be ready for him. Um, they did win the last two with the Tar Heels, but one of those games that isn't a ranked game but could be a lot of fun this weekend. Yeah, I mean that Notre Dame preseason top five ranking that's going to be that's going to be around their neck all season long, you know. And that's why uh, when you start off zero and two and you, you're going to you know you might be flirting at seven and five, six and six preseason top five feels like uh, you know a reason 
to, to, to be talking to them and to be talking about their struggles. Right. Uh, I'm curious. So Drake May was a true freshman last year, backing up Sam Howell. You talked to, to Sam. What, what did you find out from Sam? That's pretty interesting. Yeah. I mean, just their relationship, their competitors, you, you hear that all the time. Like they competed in golf and trying to hit the goal, goal post first, but they developed this friendship, both being Carolina kids. Um, I think Sam Howell is, even though he's a backup right now in Washington, that he set a standard for some of these second stint Mac Brown quarterbacks. And now they get Drake may and, you know, Sam Howell flipped from Florida state to North Carolina and Drake may flipped from Alabama to North Carolina. And we got into that with coach Brown and everything that he told me about that. It, it was a fun feature to write. Hopefully you read it because I just like the stories of his dad played there. His brother's a big deal there, but they were so big on, this is Drake's path. This isn't our path. And, and just being here in the family. And I'll tell you the one thing about Drake may just talking to him. I like guys that you can sense they're having fun and you can tell that guy's having fun. Like he, he wants to talk. He wants to go out there and play. He wants to, he's really nice. Um, and uh, I think it's going to be a fun week for him. This it is like a, as much as the app state game, that was more about the score. I think this is about his chance to go beat, Go, go figure. Notre, anytime you beat Notre Dame, like you said, that goes on your resume. No doubt. I mean, he's, he's, he's a freshman. He's got 11 touchdowns. He's tied for the lead in the nation uh, with 11 passing touchdowns. He better be having fun, right? Come on. Uh, <laughs> uh, one other topic I wanted to touch on uh, is uh, you pointed it out, Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. They are both in the top 10. They are both undefeated. Um you know, Spencer Sanders playing great at Oklahoma State at quarterback. He, uh, you know, wasn't a standout last year necessarily, had a terrific Fiesta Bowl, but has been lights out this year. Uh, they haven't played a Power 5 team yet, and they got an open date this week. Then they got Baylor uh, at Baylor on the road on October 1st for their next game. That'll be a rematch of the Big 12 championship game. And then, of course, we all saw Oklahoma whip Nebraska. Uh, their defense hasn't given up more than 14 points. And, uh, you know, Dylan Gabriel obviously playing well. What what do you see uh, out of Oklahoma? You know, the, the sky was falling when Lincoln Riley left and Caleb Williams left and Spencer Rattler left, and uh, it, the sky didn't fall. Well, no, I mean, both teams are – it's going to be fun this year. But, I mean, the, the lead there is that you saw the report today, they may not play anymore. And that's that's – where I'm getting at is we're going to have this special game this year between Spencer Sanders, Dylan Gabriel, and, and I'm only thinking, okay, how many of these are going to, we going to get left? And this is that casualty of college football in the modern era is I go back to, so I watched Fargo all the way through when that was out. And I am just reminded of the scene in Fargo where Billy Bob tells the dude in the elevator, is this what you want? And then he starts shooting stuff and the, that's what I always tell college football fans. Is this what you want? You want playoff expansion. Okay. You want realignment. You want chaos. You're going to lose some things. You lost Oklahoma, Nebraska. Now you're going to lose Oklahoma, Oklahoma state. You're going to lose USC versus Stanford possibly, you know, and all those California schools, you are going to lose some of those rivalries and you're going to lose the feel of it. And the fact that they might not play Oklahoma, Oklahoma state to me is every bit as ridiculous as, this period of time that we didn't have Texas, Texas A&M. The comparison I would draw from where I'm at is if Michigan and Michigan State didn't play or if Clemson and – well, I guess Clemson and South Carolina, if they made like a law, we're not going to play. It, it's, it's bad, and it's bad for the Big 12 that they're going to have to sell as a rivalry game. I mean, what – like somebody asked me this today, Bill, what's the Big 12's biggest rivalry now? Once if they take Texas playing. and Oklahoma out? Yeah, what's, what's their – marquee rivalry game it's is it it might be baylor oklahoma state honestly and i don't know if that's good that's not going to move the needle tv ratings wise for sure um, good game last year though really good game but oh, the big not, 12 championship yeah. game was terrific right um but uh yeah the 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 obsession with the tv ratings and the numbers and these conference uh, commissioners need to make as much money as they can that one that one's not going to move the needle and you're right. The Texas, Texas A&M rivalry. I mean, I did a story last week about, um, you know, it's sort of tongue in cheek who the A&M fans are rooting for in the Texas Alabama game. And 
the Texas Texas A and M rivalry is alive and well, and they haven't played in ten years. And uh, you know that's definitely something that, uh, especially an, an older generation of fans, you know, misses in that in that rivalry, and they can't wait to get it restarted in the SEC. All right, well, Bill, um, that was good. Uh, Thanks for uh, everybody for coming in and listening to uh, the uh, CFB Nation All-America podcast. That's our Wednesday show. Come on back tomorrow, Thursday morning. We will preview the big games for week four. We will go over our uh, confidence contest and our awesome against the spread picks. Mine aren't so as awesome as Bill's right now, but they will be soon. I promise. We'll have some trivia. We'll have some fun. Um, So that's it. Thanks, everybody, for joining here at the All-America Podcast.